Well, it's always a very emotional homecoming for me to come to this place, and uh, it's really wonderful to see all of you today. You've said the topic is filling the void. So I thought I would speak about the void between the two Indias. Millions of people do not find a place on the development map of this country. The richest 1% of Indians today own half of India's personal wealth. The rest of us, 99%, are left to share the other half. If we look at the global picture, while India has the fastest rate of growth of high net worth individuals, and also is the second fastest growing economy in the world, of the world's poorest 20% people, nearly one in four are Indians. By contrast, China's share in this bottom 20% is only 3%. In the last 20 years, more than 200,000 farmers have committed suicide. This has never happened before in Indian history. There has been distress, there have been famines, people have been hungry, people have been poor, but they have not been driven to commit suicide. And how do we know this, these facts? We have been sensitized to the importance of rigor in data this morning. And this is not data being provided by any NGO or civil society representative. This data comes out of the National Crime Records Bureau. Because, as you would know, committing suicide is a crime in this country. A former chief minister of Maharashtra, who is no longer with us, once famously said, Inko batado, main ne jail mein dal dunga because he was reminding the people of this country that committing suicide is a crime under the Indian Penal Code. At the other end of the emotional spectrum, thousands of young men and women in the tribal regions of India are taking to the gun. They have become cynical and desperate. They have lost faith in Indian democracy. That seems to them to be like an empty promise. The tribal people are the, at the bottom of the pyramid on every possible indicator of development. Health, education, poverty, I can reel off the statistics. They are also the ones who have paid the most cruel price possible for the nation's development. Millions have been displaced by so-called development projects without anywhere to go. It is also a matter of national shame that more than 600 million Indians are forced to defecate in the open every day. India also has the highest number of malnourished women and children in the world. I can go on with more data, but as you can see, nearly 70 years after independence, this is a massive void to fill. But the story I'm going to tell you today is a story of hope, a story that tells us how we can fill this seemingly impossible void. It is a story of 10 friends who decided 25 years ago to devise a new model of development that could help us fill this void. It was their view that most of India's problems are self-created and that till we change the model, we will keep getting it wrong. This was their theory of change. And what they have set up today is a powerful new alternative that can help us fill the void. I am going to tell you in brief about my organization, Samaj Pragati Sahyog, that I co-founded 25 years ago along with my friends. Today, SPS is one of the largest grassroots initiatives for water and livelihood security, working with its partners on a million acres of land in about 100 of India's most backward districts. At SPS today, educated professionals from the metros work shoulder to shoulder with local youth from the Mufassal towns and the tribal men and women themselves. Each brings their unique strengths to bear upon the enormous challenges that we face. Learning also to work with, learn from, and respect each other. 
The work of SPS has transformed landscapes, created water and livelihood security, built capacities among rural tribal people, and also made landmark changes in national programs and policies, which is enabling us to make a very large impact at scale. So what was it that needed to change, according to SPS, in the mainstream development model? First and foremost, the top-down bureaucratic approach, where decisions are made in the centralized offices of government far, far away from where the problems are. A country of India's agroecological and socio-cultural diversity just cannot afford such an approach. SPS began its work with water, and water illustrates this point the best. The focus of India's water policy was on building large dams. But we forgot that if rivers that sustain us do not live, our lives would be in danger too. What is worse, we displaced millions of people and caused massive ecological destruction, but we failed to get that water to the farmers for whom we built the dams. These kinds of last mile connectivity issues have plagued all our development efforts. Unless we decide to involve our farmers in the management of water, we cannot solve this problem. The bureaucratic approach will not work. Once farmers begin to manage water, they are able to fix a price for water that they all together agree upon in a transparent and participatory manner. This enables them to collect the irrigation service fees that they can then use to ensure that the last mile channels to carry water to their farms are both built and maintained. Because the poor state of our irrigation commands has been one of the major problems plaguing the irrigation sector. Other main plank of water development in India has been deep drilling for groundwater. India is the largest consumer of groundwater in the world, and groundwater provides 80% of our domestic water needs, including drinking water, and nearly two-thirds of our water for irrigation. When we developed our groundwater, we forgot that aquifers which store water are not all the same across India. The rocks and soils in which water is stored have different rates of recharge. When you take water out of an alluvial aquifer, such as the ones in the Indo-Gangetic Plains or the Krishna Godavari Basin, the water table recovers faster. The natural rate of recharge in these alluvial soils is high because these are highly permeable soils. On the other hand, in a hard rock aquifer, when we drill water using deep tube wells, it can take a very long time for the water table to recover. These rocks have very low permeability. And 70% of India's land mass is underlain by hard rock formations. What we have done in many areas in the last 30 years is to completely drill out, virtually mine, like you mine coal. You virtually mined the water that took a 1,000 years or more to collect below the ground without a care about its recharge. As a result, we have ourselves created a serious crisis of water, crisis of water across India, both of falling water tables and deteriorating water quality. In Punjab today, children are drinking water that has uranium in it because we have gone so far below the ground that we have hit uranium deposits. A train plies daily from Punjab to the medical capitals of the country, carrying patients suffering from cancer. The Punjabis call it the Cancer Express, both to solve the problems that have arisen and so that the problems do not arise in the first place. The solution was a completely new approach to water, an approach that is location-specific and deeply respects the balances in nature. We worry about how much water we take out of the ground, and we ensure that we put back more than we take out. 
We also involve the local people, their knowledge, and local resources. This makes our solutions more effective and more sustainable. This is the watershed management approach, which believes that India still gets enough rain to meet our needs. We just need to manage the water better. Managing a watershed means attending very carefully and lovingly to each part of the watershed. A watershed or a catchment is the area where a river or, say, a pond catch their water. The health of a river is only as good as the health of its catchment area. What SPS is doing is to restore the health of the country's catchment areas. This is e important even to protect the dams that we have built. All dams have a lifespan. One day, they will all get silted up. But how fast they silt up depends on how much soil erosion there is in their catchment areas, which in turn depends on how fast the water runs down their catchments. The whole aim of watershed management is to reduce the volume and velocity of runoff through their catchment areas. We get a lot of rain in India. The problem is, when it rains, it pours. Most parts of India get their rain in an average of 40 to 50 days of very intense rain. The challenge of watershed management is to make this 40 to 50 day water available for use in each village for at least 180 days, if not for the whole year. To make this possible, we devise imaginative interventions that help slow down the speed of water. We say, make the water walk. Don't allow it to run. And make it walk below the ground rather than above it. This makes possible is groundwater recharge and a rise in the water table so that people have enough water for both domestic use and irrigation. We weave our interventions into the contours of nature, doing only what the balance of nature can sustain at each point. We do not try to command nature like the big dam builders and the river linkers. We are rather humble students of nature. Our interventions are designed playing close attention to local slope, soil, vegetation, hydrogeology, etc. We do not build dams everywhere. At places, we only revegetate. We allow the local species to regenerate because they are the species which have stood the test of time and have protected the catchment areas over the years. At other points in the watershed, we build trenches, trenches which will contain water for a few days before letting it to flow slowly down the catchment. We also build dams. These dams are built mainly of mud and stone. But this does not mean that they are weak or fragile. They involve very careful earthen engineering. There are many IIT students who come to SPS and their first year is spent in what we call de-schooling. They need to learn about earthen engineering, which used to be taught at one time in our IITs, which is no longer taught because they only know how to build five-star hotels, the civil engineers I'm talking about, or the flyovers in the cities. They do not understand urban engineering. It is our pleasure to teach them that. Not a single dam SPS has built, and we have built thousands, has broken over the last 25 years. Today, the areas where we work continue to have water security even in drought years. Water tables have risen, irrigated area, cropping intensity, crop diversification and productivity have increased, soils are more fertile. Where people would grow a single crop and migrate to the city to look for work, today they grow two to three crops. Many people who had left for the city in distress have returned to full-time farming as agriculture has become a viable option for them. Incomes have grown, poverty has declined. What is even more important, savings have grown and are being channeled into SSGs led by women. Saved incomes are being invested, which gives rise to more incomes, leading on to a virtuous cycle of growth. 
And it is not just agriculture. Today, these people are engaged in a range of livelihoods that become possible once water security is assured. They are into dairying and fisheries and a range of skill development activities. What can be achieved when we place people at the center of the development process has become clear for everyone to see. But this is not all. Over the years, we have learned that another crucial void that needs filling and that keeps people poor is the lack of institutional strength. Without such institutions, people remain vulnerable in at least three different ways. They remain vulnerable to usurious money lenders who make it impossible for them to get free of the debt trap, condemning them to a vicious cycle of poverty. Our women's self-help groups have built such strong partnerships with banks that not only have they come out of the clutches of the rural money lenders, the profitability of loss-making banks has also been restored. People also remain vulnerable to government systems. Our SAG federations are now leading anti-corruption crusades that will hopefully ensure accountable systems of governance in these areas and improved performance of programs such as the midday meals, the integrated child development services, the public distribution system, etc. They also remain vulnerable to the market. A solitary, small and marginal farmer has no chance when confronted by powerful forces of the market, whether as consumer or producer. But just imagine when thousands of women come together, both as sellers and as buyers, the veritable transformation that occurs in the market relationship. We believe that women's empowerment and the leadership of women holds the key to all the success of SPS work. It is women who prioritize health of the family and education of children above all else. It is they who emphasize savings and building productive assets for the future. Our focus on women is not about being against men. It is about the critical role of women's leadership that men have also finally enthusiastically accepted after some initial resistance. We have also built partnerships with scientists, academics, and students who play a crucial role in enriching our work, which is why, in the end, I wish to appeal to each one of you to become part of this journey of national transformation. Everyone can and must, in their own way, join this journey to fill the void. And as many students of Ashoka University have begun to do more recently, you can join forces with us and make a very, very useful contribution. Thank you very much.